uh, without any gasoline, uh, without farmers able to grow crops, where is the food going to come from? This summer, the U.S. Catholic bishops published a letter on war and peace, specifically the nuclear question. Chicago's Joseph Cardinal Bernadine headed that effort. We asked him for a taped pastoral response to the day after. The film we have witnessed tonight is a demonstration of one of the greatest powers of the 20th century, the power of television. At this moment, we are all feeling the impact of this film. Some of you may feel empty, confused, depressed. Others may feel angry that this film would even be on television, and still others that it is a complete fantasy. Some of you may feel convinced of the need for a stronger nuclear arsenal so that this will never happen, while others may feel convinced that we must rid the world of all these weapons. In a way, each of us is troubled by the fear that what we have seen could happen. To all of you, I wish to say a word about a dimension which some say is lacking in the program itself. It is a word from the religious perspective, a word of moral concern, a word of hope. The Roman Catholic bishops of our country have spent the past several years discussing the specifically moral dimension of the nuclear question. Because the question is not simply political, but also a profoundly moral and religious one, the church must be a participant in the task of protecting the world and its people from the specter of nuclear destruction. Silence in this instance would be a betrayal of our responsibility. That is why the recent pastoral letter of the bishops says a firm no to any use of nuclear weapons against civilians, no to any first use of nuclear weapons, no to the concept of a limited nuclear war. We have called upon government leaders and the general public to recognize the unique danger of the nuclear age, to give priority to the task of halting the arms race immediately on a bilateral basis and pursuing vigorously substantial reductions in nuclear arsenals. Finally, a word about the basis for our hope. My reason for hope is not an empty or pious wish. I believe in a God who is close to us, who does not leave us to face the challenges of life alone. This same God has given us the gift of reason. We have developed that gift through science and wisdom. I believe that this same human quality will enable us to reverse the trends depicted in this film. Let us see to it that the day after remains simply the fantasy of script writers and actors, a television nightmare. We can do that by building a barrier against the concept of nuclear war as a strategy for defense. We can do that by shaping a citizen's coalition that demands that the arms race be reversed. We can do that. The Cardinal also re-emphasized his feelings that the absence of war is not peace, that peace must be actively constructed. We now have some of your called-in questions to the panel that are ready, as a number of people are calling in, as you might expect. Robert Berry of Kansas City, Kansas, has a two-part question, and I'll direct this to Mr. Holland. Is he trying to say we can survive a nuclear war, and what kind of insanity will we be coming out of the shelter into, Mr. Holland? Well, we can survive a nuclear war if we are properly prepared. But the important point is that if we are properly prepared to survive, we probably won't be attacked because deterrence will be enhanced. I, I ran around that one. But uh, if, if uh, shelters, if we do have a blast shelter system, uh, we can save uh, hundreds of millions of lives that would other be otherwise perish, as shown in this movie, for a cost of about $100 billion, about a little, slightly less than half of the cost of the Defense Department's budget for one year, we can uh, construct a blast shelter program, and even with an all-out uh, Soviet attack, God forbid, we could save 90% of our population. Dr. Ehrlich, how do you answer that question? Well, I, first of all, let me say I agree with the FEMA man that uh, having some preparation is a good thing because it can work in things like earthquakes. It will not, however, if the atmospheric physicists are, physicists are right, and virtually everybody that I have talked to thinks they are right, 
uh, save hundreds of millions of lives in the United States. First of all, the prompt effects in the United States will get about 150 million people in a full-scale nuclear attack, and that doesn't leave 100 million people. And second of all, people have to eat. And as a biologist, I can tell you, if you turn it down to 40 below zero in Lawrence, Kansas, put out the lights, add the toxic smog and so on, there ain't going to be nothing to eat and you are not going to have a surviving society. The consensus of 50 very distinguished biologists with very different views of the world all agreed unanimously that the northern hemisphere would basically be wiped out and possibly all of humanity if we had a full-scale nuclear war and these atmospheric effects uh, ensued. Dr. Ehrlich, which, which takes us to our next question, which was called in by Alice Martinez of Kansas City, and she asks, is any place outside the U.S. safe from nuclear attack? Uh, no place is, of course, on the planet safe, totally. Obviously, you would have a better chance in the southern hemisphere. It would depend entirely on what happened to the atmosphere, the transport of materials from the northern to the southern hemisphere. But what is crystal clear from the physicist's results is it will not be pleasant in the southern hemisphere either. And remember, there's not much in the southern hemisphere. Most people in the world, about almost four billion of us, are in the northern hemisphere. Mr. Holland, as a nuclear uh, physicist, would you like to take a crack at that question? Um, I, I think... Uh, I think we really don't know enough about these long-range effects, but I think they are grossly exaggerated by the nuclear winter because they, they have a one-dimensional, simple model. They don't take into account scavenging processes, simple weather processes, but I think it really needs to be investigated a great deal more about the nuclear winter. Here's a question from Jim Ryan of Kansas City. He, he says, assuming we lay down our arms, who would be shot if the Soviets came here to take over? Mr. Holland, you want to try that one? Well, I, I know that uh, Stalin uh, uh, was responsible for killing about 20 million of his own countrymen, and uh, there were about 14 to 18 million Soviets killed back in the uh, Soviet uh, Revolution. They, they certainly don't have any compunctions about killing their own people, so, but I'm not going to say who they'll kill of ours. People. Dr. Ehrlich, how about you? Well, Could you uh, take nobody, a crack at that nobody question? Nobody with any sense is talking about laying down their arms. We have a dangerous enemy. Uh, and a dangerous enemy that you can't trust is precisely who you want to have arms control agreements with that are verifiable, uh, that are checked very carefully to make sure that they don't cheat on it. Nobody is suggesting laying down their arms, but if the Soviets did come, I can guarantee you they would absorb the FEMA people and so on as apparatchiks right into their apparatus because that's what conquering people always do. They take the government bureaucrats and add them to the conquering government and they make out just fine. We've somewhat uh, covered this uh, issue uh, that Jeff Reed of Kansas City calls in, but let's uh, summarize it again. He asks, what chances does a person have of surviving a nuclear attack? Mr. Brandy, would you like to answer that one? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, his eminence is uh, very, uh, very uh, articulate in talking about the, the key that we in civil defense echo, that is the need for hope, the need to move ahead. I think the biggest enemy after uh, the nuclear explosion is man himself. I think the inability of people to, to, to relax and to respond that, and through a sound civil defense program means more people living. You know, the important thing in life is not whether some of you want to die or some of you want to live. Government has an obligation to make that option available to say to people, you can survive if you wish to survive. Everybody could survive. Everyone, would, not in a sense if it falls on top of you, but a large majority of people would have the option with a sound civil defense program to decide for themselves. In the movie, it strikes very much opposed to what his eminence said. It lacks hope. The biggest hole in that movie is there is no hope, and that's wrong. Mr. Brandy, thank you very much. Some of our uh, panelists are due now at the candlelight peace vigils in Lawrence in Kansas City. We wouldn't want to hold them up. We want uh, all of you uh, for flying in. We thank you from around the country for this most necessary discussion tonight. Now, right now, the Channel 9 News staff is preparing national and international reports to reaction to the day after. Uh, we'll get to that in the 10 o'clock news. And following the news, a special edition of ABC News Viewpoint program with Ted Koppel. The guests there will include Dr. Henry Kissinger and Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger. Also at 10 o'clock on the Channel 9 News at 10, we'll rejoin those peace vigils and hear from a child psychologist on how to handle the film's effects now, now that it is over. And commentator Walt Bodine, very well known in the Kansas City area, has the results of a radio poll that he conducted on how you feel about this film. It's going to take time for all of us to decompress from this night, and for that reason, our Channel 9 special report, Sunday, Nuclear Sunday, will continue.